So this is a team one, building exercise. <laughs> two. A one, two, three, four. Right. 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 Right it right now. Right. 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 With all your might now. Right. 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 Keep it light now. Right. 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 Keep it bright now. Right. 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 Bye 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 now. Right. 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 Day and night now. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. Yes, that was a new cheer. By our lovely Fedora name. And this and is then performed and coached and by and <laughs> coached and yeah, and I am your host David Allen Lucas, president of St. Louis Writers Guild. With me today is Lee Savage, author of Erotic Romance, and under the pen name Carrie Lee Williams, a couple of children's books. I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. Brad R. Cook. I am a steampunk author. I am a blogger, uh, and you can get uh, the Iron Chronicles uh, at your you know local bookstore like Main Street Books. Uh, check out the Writer's Lens at writerslens.com and definitely take a look at my new short story, A Clockwork Heart. Uh, you can find it on Amazon or my website, bradarkirk.com. Fedora Amos, I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and my newly released Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West, which has some good reviews and I'm real happy about that. And I'm also a, pres- a vice president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. I'm Melanie Quaney, author of nonfiction, science fiction, and fantasy. And today we're going to celebrate both the birth and the death of one of the greatest writers in the English language, William Shakespeare himself. And we are going to talk about Right Pack Rule Number Four, Step Four: Get It on Paper. And that's why we did the cheer, (laughs) because that is the most important thing one can do to write, and it's simply to write. (laughs) Exactly. And. As we're going to talk about writing real fast, um, you may have, you, the audience, may have noticed some changes in graphics and so forth for Right Pack Radio. That's because a new company has started up, which is pulling Right Pack Radio underneath it. It's called WindingTrailsMedia.com, dedicated to the imagination and the theater in the mind. And we will be producing um, audio plays. So if you are a writer listening to us and you're interested in audio plays, or writing an audio play and having it produced, go to www.windingtrailsmedia.com for details. And with that, let us begin. First off, um, William Shakespeare. There are a lot of conspiracies about William Shakespeare and his writing. Uh, Conspiracies or conspiracy theories? Conspiracy theories, conspiracies, people running around in aluminum hats, um, you know. There were a lot General of, panic. <laughs> a lot of PhD candidates who didn't have any idea what to write about. Yeah, I'll go there. <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, <laughs> Nobody really knows when William Shakespeare was born. We know he was born in the month of April. We know he was born in 1564. But his date of, <coughs> his date of birth is approximately April 26th. Um, he was born in, Stra- in Stratford on, a- on Avon. He is known as the Bard in England and basically the Bard period. He was married um, to Anne Hathaway. We don't know much about the, about the marriage. <laughs> Sorry, there's not, not the, Anne Hathaway. Not the actress. current Anne not Hathaway. Not the actress Anne Hathaway, but a, a previous Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. <laughs> Or yeah. Anne Wheatley. There's oh, come on. Shakespeare discussed could not about the name. Obviously. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Discussed. And well, come Basically, on. nothing is said about Shakespeare except for the fact that he wrote really, really well. Yes. No, actually, that's not said. Well, you know, these are classics that have lasted no, for 500 that's years. That's not what I mean by did he write them. Yeah, we'll get into that later, but the we're fact that these exist... We're celebrating the man and his body of work today, whether or not the history holds up as to whether or not it was... And what I'm going to say with that is... Irreg- is regardless. <laughs> Good job! Yay! <laughs> right! Right! <laughs> Sidebar, that word somehow got, that non word somehow got into my vocabulary, and I did not know this till recently. Go anyway. back a couple episodes, it's all explained. <laughs> yeah, no. Regardless of whether or not he wrote it or not, he was the driving force behind the plays, and without that driving force, we would be so much less than we are. Um, Shakespeare, we know, went to London in 1580, uh, where he first appears as an actor. Eventually, he um, does become, he actually becomes a, supposedly an actor, a writer, um, and also gets his own um, theater. And by the way... The Globe Theater. The Globe. He used to um, work out of a theater known as The Rose, which used to be next to the main sewers. And by the way, back then, 
sewers were open. So if you've ever wondered where the phrase, a rose by any other name smells as sweet, that was a pun by Shakespeare. Very Talking. good at puns. Oh, he was very funny. Uh, eventually, and he does die, as we know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of obvious. Allegedly, I saw him at Starbucks last week. <laughs> well, I don't know. You had him dating the With new Elvis. <laughs> but, um, uh, The same year, another poet, um, Richard Branfield, added his praise of Shakespeare's honey flowing vein in the remembrance of some English poets, declaring, Well, may the body die. But fame dies never. Um, when did he die? The 23rd of the April, uh-huh. 1616. Yep. 400 Thank years ago. And with that, let's talk about rule number four. Get it on paper. And remember, back then, not that many people were reading. That's why plays were so important. Not many people could read. Not many <laughs> could. <laughs> there's there's think, a reason not everyone was reading. You think if English would eventually go on to create an empire that... The sun would never set on it until after World War II. So what is getting, why, why get stuff on paper? Why can't I just sit around at the bar like some pretend playwrights of his day and drink my mead and drink my drink and drink my drink and fall over drunk and never have done it? Well, I would say that's the difference between being the guy sitting at the end of the bar who's telling everyone in the bar wild tales that they'll never believe and being what's known as an actual writer um, is that, you know, putting it down on the piece of paper. Uh, we can all go around. We're all storytellers. I mean, every human being is a storyteller. We love telling stories. Uh, the difference becomes when you actually make it make sense, big part of that, and you put it down so that other people can read it. It's much easier or to perform share it. Yeah. yeah, if it's in some physical... I mean, the reason we still know about Shakespeare to this day, I mean, there isn't probably, you know... A theater in this world that hasn't at some time put on a Shakespeare play, and I would, you know, say that he has never gone out of production. There has always been a Shakespearean work in production since you know the six, you know the fifteen hundreds. Mm-hmm. And I will say, and if you look at that, like some of the Indian cultures and stuff, look at how much of their stories have been lost. Because they were a culture that just pulled it and passed it down from person to person. Well, when that got broken, and that chain was broken, the stories were lost forever. Now, that's a good point. You can pick up a novel that's 100 years old, and when it was paper, you can still read it after 100 years. Not so sure about these electronic formats mm-hmm. lasting that that's long. You can go back further than that. Yeah. We have 1200s. Gutenberg. Go back even further than that. You can go back to the Sanskrit tablets, mm-hmm. which the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the oldest stories we have, um, you know, because it was written down on clay tablets that we are still able to interpret to this day. And in fact, just recently, within the last month of you listening to this, they found a new couple more lines to the Gilgamesh yep. tale that seems to change it a bit. couple lines? What, they found <laughs> like a sliver of clay out somewhere and said, hey, look, this Probably. is an addendum. No, I, I, I thought they found like more than that, and part of it had already been told, and then a couple yeah. of new things. Mm. Um, we find new, you know, uh, books of the Bible, even. Mm-hmm. Well, no one can read the book in your head, not even you. No. Nope. Mm-hmm. I forget stuff that I've written. I mm-hmm. cannot write the same. If I wrote the same book again, it wouldn't be the same book again. Yeah. It would be different. Exactly. This is why I hate when my computer crashes and I have to recreate things. Yes, it's a well, thing. I have a motto for that. My motto is, now's, now's your chance to do it again better. There you it go. won't be the same. Try and make it better because you've already got that practice out. And Hemingway had that practice. Mm. Ernest Hemingway. I talked about this in a episode a long time ago when Mike. I think I did. It might have been before that we turned on the mic. But I, I had lost a lot of stuff when I had my computer crash. And the story with Hemingway was that he was having trouble getting published. He met somebody over in France, definitely in Europe, um, who was interested in publishing his books. His wife put all of his work into some suitcases, put it on the train, the train lost it, and he had to go back and rewrite everything, and it turned out better. And the very same thing could have happened to Shakespeare, yeah. because his friends wrote down his plays from their playbooks and put it into a folio so that it actually got published. And that's why it was one of the very few things saved from those times at all, because it was not considered to be great literature by them particularly. Mm. It was fun. It was fun. It was popular literature. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Brad, you started off your writing career as a playwright. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when you write a play and it gets produced, does it not change as you're going? Well, there. I mean, as a writer, Mm -hmm. things will always change. However, I will say that whenever a work gets put on stage, instantly it starts to change. The director 
will make changes that the director wants to make, either in terms of what he uses for this scene versus this scene, how time plays out, all that kind of stuff. What and he cuts. Yeah, what he, what's good, good cut. Stuff. And then the actors will change things. Uh, some actors, you know, may not remember every single word of dialogue you wrote down. Um, they'll remember the essence of it, and they'll, you know, do it that way. They might ad lib in their own material at some point, or and if they're know. a famous comic, they surely will ad lib exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, uh, kind of famously with plays, uh, as the as as an, you know as the writer of a play, you know that you have created this kind of framework and then you're turning it over to others and it will never look the same way again mm -hmm. um you know shakespeare was the, his own director so he might have yelled at people a little bit more to get it the way he wanted but you know ever since then uh you know i saw uh macbeth performed with uh eastern european uniforms and uh clear plastic weaponry mm -hmm. was the craziest Macbeth I'd ever seen. <laughs> but hey, it was an interpretation. It worked. I have a very fond memory of my, a fantastic performance of A Comedy of Errors by, uh, it was a an art camp theater class. And they literally went into the back prop room and got anything they could find. They were fighting with lightsabers. Some of them were dressed as clowns and animals. There were, People came out, but they recited all the words of Comedy of Errors. It's just so happened that, you know, main the main villains were both wielding futuristic space weapons mm -hmm. and wearing tutus. It was very strange, <laughs> but it was a it was funnier. You yeah. know, it was a comedy of errors, but it was funnier because it was just so oddball. One of my favorite interpretations of Shakespeare was done by uh, a cartoon. It was done by Gargoyles, mm. which, you know, took all the characters that Shakespeare had created, uh, from Oberon to Puck to Lady Titania, you know, all these classics, and, you know, used them, yes, in the ways of A Midsummer's Night's Dream, or they had Macbeth, you know, they used all this kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, uh, they changed things around as well. Another interpretation, actually it's funny, <clears throat> Brad, because you talked about this off mic, uh, this director in Japan, or was, he died in 1998, born on March 23rd, 1910. And that was Akira Ka Kurosawa. Thank you. I had it until I tried to open my mouth. <coughs> um, anyway, he filmed a movie called Ran. Ron. 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 In 1985. And that is a samurai adaption of a Shakespearean tragedy, King Lear. It is, Shakespeare's been hmm. translated and interpreted across the world. But you haven't heard it until you've heard it in its native Klingon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Apparently that was difficult to translate because there is no Klingon word for to be. Yes. So they had to create it. Mm -hmm. And now there is. That is in the spirit of Shakespeare, who However, invented many common words in the English Paramount language. Will come to us. Yeah. Yeah. But, and Shakespeare also invented a lot of insults that just puts our current day insults to shame. <laughs> because they're clever. They instead are clever. Of just yeah. Vulgar. Crass, yeah. So, well, some of them were both. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he was not above being vulgar. Clever no. weighs more than crass. Yes. Crass is surfacey. So... No one can read the book that's in your head. You've got to write it down. Another thing is take baby steps. Shakespeare probably wrote in the bar. He probably wrote at the side of his theater. He probably wrote wherever he bloody well could. Mm -hmm. And yes, I know in England that word's a bad word. But anyway. That's why you used it. Exactly. <laughs> but it, if you write even 100 words a day, you'll have a book in two years. Constantly write, 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 write. Do you think Shakespeare ever gave up? Yeah, I, I know he had ideas that never... They themselves never saw the play, or they might have been turned into other play. I mean, undoubtedly, he had bad days. Oh, yeah. Don't of get course. me wrong. Uh, it's, you know, I, I'm going to say it's George Orwell who famously said, write a page a day, and in 400 days you'll have a novel. Uh, it might not be the best novel in the world, but you'll have one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, that is part of it, just getting it down and getting it out of you. Don't try and be Shakespeare on the first draft. Let's put, let's just throw that out there. <laughs> you know, just be the best you can be. Don't worry about that too much, or that page won't get out of it. Well, that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Don't. Turn off your editor. Yes. For the, the first draft. Turn For the back first. on after that. Mm -hmm. Invite him to the drafts where he belongs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shakespeare had so many problems that we don't face at all. We think of a play as running at least a couple of weekends. Or on Broadway or on the West End of London, it would run for months, years, you know, decades, some of them. Yes. They would play it once, <laughs> and then maybe another ten weeks later would play it again. It was uh, 
it was seasonal. They would take it on the road, but even then, they would play several different shows in one little town and then go on to yeah. another place. Mm -hmm. So they would have to change horses all the time, and still, he had to be writing new stuff. Yeah. I don't know yes. how the actors did that. Well, one of the one of the brilliances of Shakespeare, and one of the reasons why he's so known, is because he had his own theater, and you know, he was one of the first people you would actually go to the theater and see. Most theater productions before that would be held in a king's castle or a lord's castle or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it would literally just be for the lord. It would be a, a dinner entertainment for that night. You know, he'd be having a big party and he would get the well, they theater troupe to come theater in. Too, they, they did, yeah. Which was like on top of a wagon inside a uh, courtyard yep. of an inn or a, a saloon kind of place. Very temporary. And then the actors would move on. It was yep. a very uh, hectic kind of lifestyle. And yet, what he created it's just beyond amazing yeah unlike today actors were not uh, thrown on high uh, they were very much one of the lowly classes there I saw a play I, this was not where I was going to go but you just threw it open there was a play that was here in St. Louis for a while called A Bit of the Bard it was a one man play the actor was quote unquote uh, actually let me put this in this time period it was out in the time roughly Ronald Reagan slash Bill Clinton had been around and the actor was supposedly an, a Shakespearean actor from back in the day who got himself shot in the you-know-where by lightning from another actor named Nilrim, which is Merlin spelled backwards. I'm confused. It was. It, 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 was a, it was a hilarious play, but talking about where Brad went. Now, if you understand President Ronald Reagan was an actor, the character in the play made a reference. He goes, I just don't understand you 20th Centuria. Back in my day, when we were us actors, we would be likely kicked, spit on, thrown in prison, and very luckily might get paid. But you, you proceed to make them your leader of your of your government and then proceed to make fun of him. <laughs> so this is showing a difference in the time period. Actors back then and under Shakespeare's time mm -hmm. were not treated well, and they were usually male. Yes. Picture Romeo and Juliet, yeah. <laughs> and Juliet was a male. Yeah, well, that was one of the things. If you were the young kid who mm -hmm. didn't who didn't have a deep voice and a or a beard or a beard, then you got to be all the lady characters. Mm -hmm. They must have been really good actresses, <laughs> and actors, whatever you want to call them, because uh, all of the action that we think of so much today in the films that you see of any Shakespearean productions use a lot of physical stuff, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. whereas that it was all in the words, pretty much. Mm -hmm. All of the romance was in the words for them. And they could listen lots better than we can. A Hamlet, for example, if it were done today by Americans, would take over four hours. But we know that it took just a little less than two in their time, so they must have been going at bullet kind of I was speed. Gonna say, how fast were but they, they talking? That's really fast, <laughs> obviously. But that's a difference between us and those times when those people didn't read, but rather they had to really listen and really get it. Mm -hmm. We are not like that at all. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been to Shakespeare's Theater over in London, it's rebuilt in the time period that was at. There's a big difference between plays back then and now as well as how they, were, how they were viewed. Today, you go to a theater, go to Broadway, you go wherever. You sit down, you look at the stage, lights go off, go dim, and everybody should be hushed. Nobody's talking, and the play is occurring. Uh, good viewing, if you ever watch a movie, Cyrano de Bergerac, with Gerard Depardieu, um, shows at the beginning as a play. They have sword fighting happening in front of a stage, and it's not part of the play. Mm -hmm. You got people gambling on the floor in front of the play. Nobody's paying attention. You got the peerage talking in the background. That's what Shakespeare was up against as well. Was he, him, and his actors had to do a play over the noise of the audience that were treating. Or had theater. to get their attention to the All point where everybody would listen. Exactly. Thank you. And that's what Shakespeare was really good at. I was thinking some of those plays had a quite a bit of blood in them. So, like, imagine, you know, mm -hmm. not don't make sure you don't trip on the blood on the stage. But let's go back to um, <laughs> trying to get their attention. That's what we have to do as writers, and you can't get a, you can't get your audience to listen to you until you start putting the words on the page. And that's where that's where they start paying attention. That's where you got to get your information well, out. part of the beauty of Shakespeare is the double entendre. <laughs> I mean, half of what Shakespeare is actually saying is not what he's meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, and what he's meaning is, is veiled within the words that he's using. Um, and that was very much done intentionally because he wanted you to listen to it on one level, very much giving you a message on another. And keeping people of all stripes from all 
all parts of society entertained. Exactly. So he had to use some low humor. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And some slapstick, which he certainly does in almost everything. I will say that watching certain plays, especially now that we're in the 21st century, mm -hmm. some of it is more obvious what is meant by it when the acting is added to it than just reading it. Because I probably because the actors have either done this or been directed to do this, that they, they use gestures and whatever, so you get the double entendres at least half the time versus, you know, the 20% you just get reading it. And to be able to do the double entendres, to be able to dig in deeper with your dialogue, there's only one way to do that, and that's to write every day. And Shakespeare certainly wrote every day under every imaginable inconvenience that could have come his way. Hmm. So let's, let's not get into the, the debate that you have to write every day in order to be successful at writing. I, I think don't, it should be a goal. I mean, it's, uh, I can't write every day. To, you're not going I to have, have every too much to day. do. You know? Unfortunately, writing is not my job. Writing mm -hmm. is my hobby. I would like to think that I can be successful even if I write when I can yeah. and not necessarily every single day because I draw for a living. And when I'm not drawing for a living, I'm drawing for fun to relax. <laughs> so I'm keeping those skills sharp on purpose. And then maybe once a week or so, I come, I join you guys, and we all go writing together. And it takes a little to fall back into it, but I've got my outline, and I know my characters well. And before long, they start speaking to me, and I can put some words on paper, which is the goal of our, of our rule today. Mm -hmm. Put the words on paper when you can put them on paper. Don't feel like just because you missed out on your daily writing that it's you've somehow lost your badge. We keep saying paper, but really it just means in a permanent format, like, you know, well, you can computer screen will work. That's because Shakespeare put it on paper. Mm -hmm. Right. Pixels put pixels on digital work paper. <laughs> what I'm going to say is Jen's right. And if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you know, personally, I have had that trouble of writing every day, not being able to do it. Mm -hmm. in life. I can't. Yeah. So I think, no, I, you know, you can't make it absolutely every day. Nobody can. Only mm -hmm. when I have deadlines. If you, if you, <laughs> count, if you count my college <laughs> writing, then I probably write every day. But it's for college, <laughs> not for my fun writing. So. But one of the facts is that you can't improve your writing unless you are writing. It's the, I think the lesson is to practice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right, write every day is a nice way of saying practice. Practice your thing. Mm -hmm. uh, don't lose your, your uh, polish by letting it go stale or, or rust. So let me ask this question of everybody. Where where do you write? I can picture Shakespeare writing in the pub. I write in the pub, but my mm -hmm. pub is called a coffee house. Yay. <laughs> Same here. Does anybody write at home? Um, yeah. I do. Yeah, I, write at home. Okay. I have an office, mm -hmm. and I have two computers, <laughs> one I'm researching on, one I'm writing on, and uh, I just make myself happy doing that. Do you really need two computers uh, or just two screens? Well, I have at least two or three things up on my back and then I do the research on, on a little PC over here. So I kind of got the thing covered everywhere. Uh -huh. I got my laptop and my tablet. Yeah. That's yeah. all right. Yeah. I have, I have my laptop so I primarily write in the living room. I like to have the TV on a low, usually something I've watched over and over that I don't have to pay much attention to. Mm -hmm. When I'm writing vampire, I like to put on vampire movies <laughs> like Dracula or Queen of the Dam and have that low and let that get me all like, ooh, now I'm ready to write vampire. <laughs> yeah, so, and that's how I like to write. Unfortunately, I can't write at home. I still, now, now that I don't have my old um, int interruptions, I still find I can't quite write at home. Well, you need um, a little environment. Yeah. yeah. Something that makes you feel comfortable enough to let all of those demons start talking to you. Right. But if I did write at home, my dream desk, has anybody ever seen Douglas Adam, Desk, the cartoonist? It looks like the bridge of a space shuttle Enterprise. <laughs> Computer banks all over the place, <laughs> and in a U around his chair. You can build mind. that. You can build it. I know I can build it, but damn costly. But I can yeah, it'd be much more affordable now than a few years ago. Well, yeah, assemble that, it up stuff you already have in your house. When yeah. I used to have an office, back when we were renting a house and we had an office, that was one thing. You, you decorate your walls or whatever around your writing space with inspiration. So I had all kinds of male models. Pictures <laughs> plastered all over uh, my wall. The the inspiration Pinterest board uh, of yes. the erotic writer is all. Except it wasn't one wall. My whole way around <laughs> was completely covered. You have a husband. What did he say about that? He didn't care. He wasn't allowed okay. in that room. Okay. <laughs> no, he, 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 he was up there. He doesn't mind because it leads to other activities. Okay. 
<laughs> well, on a completely different note, yeah. um, <laughs> recently I started actually using voice recognition, and I discovered almost by accident that my phone's voice recognition is actually pretty good. Hmm. So, you know, just pick it up. I'm still laying in bed, and I just start talking. <laughs> it makes some very funny mistakes. Apparently, my phone does not know my main character's name. So once I had it all done and emailed it to myself and transferred it to a word program, I did find and replace, and there were roughly, all told, about 50 instances of, uh, spread over about three or four different names uh -huh. that I just had to change it all to my main character's name. <laughs> yeah, Dragon was never good with names either. No. I used to do voice recognition writing, but I found that it's faster for me to use my fingers. Yeah, it my might brain, be faster if I know what I'm writing. <laughs> my brain doesn't operate well enough to do to just speak the story. I, I definitely need good. to rock back and yeah. forth. My over other problem it. was there'd be like you know I'd be yelling at the cat and that would. Be <laughs> <laughs> and, so. unint unintentional comedy. Exactly. I agree with you, Jen. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also laughing. I'm gonna explain why I was laughing mm -hmm. in a minute. But um, yeah, what I have trouble with the voice recognition is as I'm writing. Period. No, that should be a comma. Scratch that. No, it should be a whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's doing the grammar. I can the punctuation. The punctuation. Yeah. Everything. I would only do voice recognition with the very first draft. Yeah. You have to really rewrite anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But while I was laughing at it's not quite good enough where you can be like flag that part right there, point it at the screen yeah. or something. This will probably show up as a radio drama um, produced by. Um, Winding Trails Media, and that is it's a space western in the sense of Firefly, where the character is Hispanic, at least in background. I didn't design them originally, but when I first started writing the dialogue, next thing I know I've got um, the hola, como esta, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I'm here, I'm talking to, originally wrote this as a rough draft novel using Dragon, and I would go back between English and Spanish to the point where Dragon was starting to identify my English as being spelled wrong <laughs> and my Spanish was correct. <laughs> Actually, I'm looking at uh, using uh, voice recognition for upcoming project of stories that are already written. Mm -hmm. Need to be so, transcribed. But they were written with typewriter mm -hmm. from my dad, so what I'm wanting shame. to redo them. So I figured the easiest way to get the rough draft up instead of having to try to retype them all is use the voice recognition. Good. Then go in and edit them since I'm going to be changing them to dark horror erotica anyway. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What would Dad say to that? <laughs> if it gets it published, he would say, go right. on. Go for it. Go. <laughs> well, since this is Awake to Shakespeare, one of the things I wanted to throw out there, were the, you know, yes, a toast to Shakespeare. Clink, 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 This would actually pick up the clink yeah. if we yeah, had the clink. If we had metal things. But anyway, I wanted to throw out some of the amazing things that Shakespeare has done. And one of them is lexicon that we still use to this day. Um, Shakespeare created a lot of the slang that we still use from knock knock who's there <laughs> to wear your heart on your sleeve mm -hmm. to come what may so so fight fire with fire bated breath a heart of gold um, too much of a good thing break the ice the naked truth what's done is done uh, dead as a doornail fair play foul play uh, be all, end all, a brave new world, the green-eyed monster, <laughs> uh, love is blind, um, laughing stock, vanished into thin air, uh, for goodness sakes, um, a wild goose chase, to break the ice, uh, and many, many more which you can find all over. But all of those were created, they didn't exist until Shakespeare came along, or if they did, they weren't used regularly and yet but they weren't written down which exactly is yeah. uh, but or here we are it survived. <laughs> here we are 400 years later and we still use these phrases oh yeah not so. to mention the words eyeball and elbow yes <laughs> you meant an elbow I mm -hmm. i'm actually that surprised about i've seen that a couple reason. places mm -hmm. i don't know what they called that joint in your arm before but the joint in my arm the joint in your arm the bendy part the part that bends it's the bendy is what part. they call it <laughs> But yeah, you never know. A Latin word. Yeah. You know what we'll be saying 400 years from now uh, that will still be around. LOL. I mean, okay. <laughs> well, certain things have changed. I mean, you know, yeah, LOL used to be cool, but now it's not as cool as you know. No, but everyone knows what it means. It does. Yeah. At some point in 10 years, some kid is gonna bring it back and think he's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> We can all kick that kid when well, he shows we probably up. Probably 
aren't very good at thinking about what words are new and likely to survive because they're probably so much part of our vocabulary that we don't realize they're new. Well, and also, too, our, our language has changed, has evolved mm -hmm. so much over the last several decades, hell, even over 100 years. Yet we don't really have trouble understanding Shakespeare. No. Mm -hmm. And that's really the odd thing. I mean, there's a lot of phrases I can use thinking about this now that go back 200 years. 300, 400 years, they've changed, and people would sit there and wonder and question. Actually, let me use a phrase that's less than 100 years old that had changed meaning, and hopefully now the meaning's going back to its original form, gay. A lot of times now, gay is thought of as homosexual. Back in the days, mm -hmm. it was The happy. gay 90s was just happiness. Happiness. Mm -hmm. Gay yeah. 90s would be gay 1890s, by the way. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the gay 1990s means homosexual. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so point blank, there's an example of how the word has changed. Oh. But yet Shakespeare wrote, what, 400 years ago? Yes. And we still understand. I mean, how, 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 what did he do to do that? Actually, I don't think you can chalk that up to Shakespeare so yeah. much as Samuel Johnson <laughs> <laughs> who wrote a dictionary and yeah. created a, <laughs> you know, a lexicon that uh, was standardized, which we would never had before. And I think part of it, too, is that Shakespeare's, you know, his plays have never gone out right. of production. You know, we still hear them. We still study them in, you know, high school and mm -hmm. college and things of that nature. So, you know, it, it is something that's been refreshed. And now you might not study as much Shakespeare, but you know, 100, 200 years ago, that's what you studied in terms of, like, classical literature and stuff like that. There wasn't a ton of classical literature, so that's what you studied, Shakespeare. You know, Brad, a lot of the things that you read were, oh, why can't I think of the name of this? They were phrases that have particular meanings that are based on social context that you know about. They don't mean anything without that context. I mean, not eyeball and elbow, mm, yeah. but... Much Ado About Nothing, mm -hmm. um, uh, Brave... Okay, well, I can't think of them off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but the point is, a lot of them are built into the culture. And someone mentioned that Shakespeare never goes out of production. Well, you know, there's still the movies, even if, even if people haven't actually gone to see the plays. So... Well, there's always new stuff the, being produced. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it keeps it in the social consciousness. Josh mm -hmm. Whedon just did much ado about nothing. Mm -hmm. Yes, he didn't do it very well. Oh, I think he did. <laughs> I enjoyed it, but he did it. I like. I like the tour of Josh Whedon's house. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was fun. Well, well, yes, also, but that's not the play. <laughs> yeah, I liked how he recast a certain mm. view of the male characters as female and kept the dialogue exactly the same. But boy, were those actions different. Yeah. You know. Well, I talked a couple weeks ago about really liking uh, Baz Luhrmann's uh, Romeo and Juliet because I just thought it was an interesting take on, you know, that mm -hmm. tale. You know, he oh, kept all the dialogue. Seen that. Oh, it's a, it's an interesting one. It's uh, Claire Danes and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, I did see that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, never mind. I didn't. Yeah. But you know, it's it's just stylized and it's kind of crazy, and I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I really enjoyed Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet. Yes. Uh, it's a very much a. a, a a departure from your classic Hamlet, like Mel Gibson tried to do. Um, <laughs> tried. <laughs> but, Very well, also. Yes. You know, so, you know, but, uh, in, you know, we talk about a lot of actors today, they come out of the Shakespearean theater. Um, it used to be that you had to come out of the Shakespearean theater. That was the only way you were a true actor. Um, it, otherwise, you were just a guy who liked to recite lines or something like that, but... If you hadn't done Shakespeare, you hadn't you weren't a true actor until you'd done Shakespeare. Yeah, he really has been kind of a, um, you know, the linchpin of culture for four hundred years. One thing Josh Whedon said made some sense to me. <laughs> he sort of apologized for uh, making as you like it. In that he said he did not have to create the ultimate as you like it. Just one more version much of it. About much ado about nothing. You're right. Mm -hmm. Just one more version of it, exactly. and that there are a whole string of them, and will be a whole string more. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And if you take any drama class, probably in high school, you are going to do something to do with Shakespeare. Well, if you take a, hitch, a literature class in mm -hmm. high school, you're going to mm -hmm. do Shakespeare. That's where I read Othello, and that's where I read 
um, Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet was all in literature class. We didn't do any of that in drama class. I love a Taming of the Shrew. We studied in high school. Mm-hmm. No, my high we school, did some of those we did and... Romeo and Juliet in freshman year. I remember doing Julius Caesar senior year. There were we didn't do it in eleventh grade because that was American literature, not English literature. Mm-hmm. And I don't yeah. remember sophomore year. <laughs> just at all. It's just all gone. Yeah. yeah. All we did. When, all we did was Romeo and Juliet and Julius Caesar. I do remember for drama having to learn the death scene for Romeo and Juliet to do in front of the class, and I and I don't remember what kind of scene, but I did do a scene for much to do about nothing for drama class. Yeah, my love for Shakespeare didn't come around till college, after college actually, because it wasn't done well in high school. But <laughs> for uh, me, it was seeing it on the stage. There you go. Uh, you know, uh, very young, uh, went over to the Edison Theater, which is over at uh, Wash U, mm-hmm. and saw Midsummer's Night's Dream. Um, I, saw, I saw that production. You know, um, I saw several over there. Um, but for me, reading Shakespeare is hard. Mm-hmm. It is not the easiest thing in the world to read. But the minute you start saying the words, the minute you start reciting the lines, the minute you know you see it done, it starts to make sense. You start to hear how it makes sense. And I, I, I really, truly loved it, you know, kind of, that gave me my love of Shakespeare. Plus, at the time, it was getting to watch sword fights in class. <laughs> yeah. Well, Shakespeare himself was a master of timing and, and the rhythm of the words. And tragic endings. Oh, yeah. Hence, my first stories were very much tragic endings that I wrote because of Romeo and Juliet the thorn birds and gone with the wind and all that other literature that we had to read in high school that all had epic love stories and tragic endings. So I thought in order to write a good love story, it had to have a tragic ending. Well, Shakespeare treats some of the great immutable themes of all time. Uh, Jealousy, betrayal, grasping power from uh, People who don't deserve it. He treats us some of the big, big things. Giving too much away, even to your own children, and how devastating that can be. So he treats of issues that are that are just really gigantic out there, while at the same time making characters who are sometimes lovable, sometimes hateable, but always interesting. Um, sorry, we're just talking Always. about Shakespeare. It just made me look it up. Locally, this April, you can see performances of Shakespeare, and we'll try and link that to our on our Facebook page. I was trying to look Shakespeare in the park up. What's this we park? <laughs> <laughs> we, as in the show. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking the we would be either you or Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> That's where Thus we're going. <laughs> Thus she doth volunteer thy <laughs> friends. <laughs> Shakespeare in the Park, the show? Uh, it is a Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm. Mm. That is always a lovely show with yeah, all kinds of magic. And, and that's I at love the beginning of June. Yeah. And what's the, that's at the beginning of June, but there is actually something this April apparently to coincide with his birthday. Sure. And yeah, sure. All that. Um, and I. Well, apparently it's on Euclid Avenue, so I guess it left bank books, uh, Shakespeare Festival reads. The Women of Will, 7 a.m., Euclid Avenue. Apparently, there's all sorts of activities. Check your local city listings. Um, yeah, because yeah, I'm sure your city, if you're not here in St. Louis, is probably doing a ton of Shakespeare productions for mm-hmm. his 400th. And depending on when you're listening to this, those productions we mentioned are not going on anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, this no, this will be in April 2016. Well, it's, uh, and I hope that we still have listeners on into. April 2017 and 2018. Well, Check the more. month of, of uh, April. I was going to say, still check your local listings, because I or guarantee you they're probably show. doing a Shakespearean <laughs> production. <laughs> so, how has Shakespeare affected you as a writer? I know. Let me throw up that heart. <laughs> Hit a I, ball. I, I would know. love to thine use thine <laughs> language of thy bard. <laughs> Unfortunately, ye, though it is, I cannot speak thine way. That he did. <laughs> in, so the, in, in those days heart, of yawn. Upon thy heart, I swear, yes. the ink runneth red across the across the page and drips slowly onto the floor. If I could, I would, but I can't, so no. I don't. Well, we don't trust me. Like you, you won't find it. 
We don't speak like that anymore. Well, I think he was an inspiration because he was an ordinary Joe mm -hmm. who had a hell of a time making a living and then on top of that did the most brilliant writing that the world has ever known. I yeah. mean, you got to admire something like that. And it sort of says, well, gee, if he could do it, maybe I could have a little bit. With that, Brad, you and I were talking before we turned on the mic about one of the conspiracy theories about Shakespeare not writing his, ah, uh, you get ready for it, <laughs> well, not writing all the plays, and I don't know if I agree with that or not. It's my favorite conspiracy around Shakespeare. Okay. You were talking about education. Yeah, uh, so basically to kind of throw it out in a nutshell, um, which might actually be a Shakespearean phrase. Um, <laughs> I think it is, but go ahead. To throw it out there, there is a, a theory that Shakespeare did was could not have written uh, such amazing work. And one of the main theories given for the reason for this is because he did not have the education level um, to write. In fact, uh, there's no proof that he was ever actually taught how to write. Um, so because of that, uh, there, there's a lot of people, and I will say that... This is not a new theory. This theory has been around since the, uh, the 19th century, since the 1800s, uh, when it first appeared. And it even goes back further than that, if you believe the ways. But that's when they first started writing books about it. Hmm. Um, but the, the, you know, there are several people who are thrown about as possible candidates for having written for him. One being Sir Francis Bacon, uh, another being Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, uh, Christopher Marlowe, when William Stanley, the sixth Earl of Derby. Um, and, and part of the reason that this is given is is that there's such layering in. Shakespeare was a commoner, and we've talked about that. Um, now, I personally don't think that you have to have massive education to write genius. Um, That's where I wanted to go with this. Mm. But I, I do have to say that one of the things that you will find in some of his works is biting political commentary about the crown. Shakespeare really had no reason to hate the queen or to hate the crown other than, you know, the fact that they were nobles and he was not. Um, however, Sir Francis Bacon and some of the others that I just mentioned uh, very much did have reason to want to criticize uh, the nobles of the day, the crown, and things of that nature, well, but wait could a not. There's a difference between the queen yes. and, and other. Yes. Other. <laughs> but you know, the point being is that uh, they were in positions of power. They were ministers to the queen. They were minister. You know, they were part of the nobility, so they could not openly criticize their own class, their own power structure, without losing their jobs and probably their heads. So there is the theory that. Uh, they wrote the plays, and some of the plays, for Shakespeare. And then, you know, Shakespeare put his name on them, or as some of the movies have told, uh, just handed him a stack of papers, and he went off and did them and became, you know, the famous uh, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Have you read any of their stuff? <laughs> I'm sure you haven't seen it now, because... Is a pity she's a whore, just doesn't get on much these days. <laughs> <laughs> Their stuff is many good, that's why. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, and like I said, it's a theory. And they this wrote no stuff much. under their own name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. very much so. Uh, and some of them were better writers than others, but, well, you know, it is it is kind of going back and forth. But and to throw it out there, you know, it is a theory, and it's a fun theory to kind of throw mm -hmm. around. Yeah. Um, it's hogwash. <laughs> there I you agree. go. It's I fun for hogwash. some. It's button-pushing for others, there apparently. <laughs> I agree, it's hogwash. I mean, one of the things about Shakespeare, as we know, he was a coward. He was also performing in the Queen's Men and the King's Men after Queen Elizabeth died and, um, and became under King James I, um, known as the King's Men actors. He's around the royalty. He's around the, how should I say, the higher educated of the day. I can't believe that none of that would have rubbed off and he would not have been learning and observing as we all of us writers do. We observe society. Everything that he's written uh, supports the the undeniable God-given right of kings. Mm -hmm. He might, uh, you know, skewer a few people who weren't so important that he could get away with. But when well, he showed never the, the bad queen. sides too, never the queen. Yeah. Sure. Well, that was part of the you know the, the theory is is that it was more of a 
biting commentary of their peers than it was trying to actually say something bad about the king or queen. Well, I'm sure we've all been in a situation where you're in a social group, you're trying to kind of integrate new people that you don't know very well who don't know you, and you start telling similar jokes because mm -hmm. you, you want to get on the good side. I'm very guilty of that. There have been more than one party where I've left and I assume they all think that I'm a roaring drunk <laughs> because all of my jokes and all my conversations led to what kind of liquor I like to drink because they were all drinking and they like to drink and it was the only thing that I knew that I had in common with them that I could <laughs> carry on a conversation with even though I drink maybe once a month and it's usually one shot of whiskey over the course of four hours. I don't drink very much, uh, but for all they know, I am very experienced. <laughs> because I told, I, I was trying to play to my audience, and I have a feeling that has a lot to do with what found its way, both on the crass side and in the refined side of Shakespeare's plays. He's playing to the groundlings, which were the ones that were arm wrestling in front of the stage. Yes. And he was also playing to the higher ups who were sitting in the balconies uh, so that everyone would have something to and enjoy. And that's his genius. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most definitely. And he could write for all those different levels. Mm -hmm. yes. That is true. They could please them all. Now, also to throw out, my other favorite Shakespeare story, uh, which is a, a more recent find that they think is true. <laughs> um, but apparently, as the, as the, as the story goes, uh, the Globe Theater, before Shakespeare took it over, was uh, housed by one of Shakespeare's rivals. And so he got together a bunch of actors, probably about 30 or 40, and they all went over with swords, and they kicked the actors and the owners out of the Globe Theater, <laughs> raised it to the ground, carried it board by board to where it currently sits, and rebuilt it as the Globe Theater because he liked it so much. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff, though. I just love the idea of it. And, and regardless if he wrote all those plays or if he had them <clears throat> done, he himself produced them. <clears throat> <all those. laughs> I, call it, I said regardless. I got. I call I, it. That wasn't why. That's not why she was doing it. She's very much going after you for yeah, no, no. claiming if, Shakespeare might not. If, yeah. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm going with this for a reason. <laughs> if he did not. Regardless if he did not, he had the ear, he had the mind to choose the works and kept them uniform, if you will, and with the ability to identify what played across all the audiences. So his detractors, I'm sorry, if you are right, well guess what, he still had an ability that most people today don't have. Well, because he produced them and directed right, them. Right, exactly. He's the George Lucas of the day, back then. The, the George Lucas circa the George Lucas 70s and 80s of the day. Circa <laughs> the 1980s, yes. Not the... Okay, he's the Martin Scorsese of the day. He, he's the... He's the <laughs> Joss Wheaton, how's that, of the day? Uh, Joss Wheaton of the day. Well, he was good at killing off people I love. In 400 <laughs> years, we'll still be saying, like, a leaf on the wind. Oh. No. <laughs> My the poor song. heart... <laughs> I would have married him if he wasn't already married to someone who could kill me. <laughs> um, I was currently reading a book, uh, it's called The Air Affair by Jasper Ford, mm -hmm. and one of the running subplots in the book <laughs> is who was the author of Shakespeare, was it, and they, uh, this is, it, it's done very comically, but mm -hmm. I mean, they, they address very various people and it all turned out, like it probably wasn't him because, uh -huh. but uh, in the end, and yes, this is a, this is actually a, a satire, uh, but um, there's time travel in this book, so the main character asks her father, and the father just pops back in time and checks it out. Turns out he hadn't written them, so he just brought the complete works of Shakespeare gave it back to him. So, you know, whole bootstrap paradox, no one wrote Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I would say, though, that uh, one of the things I find fascinating about Shakespeare uh, and one of the things I kind of enjoy is that now we would classify him as having written in almost every genre. Yeah. Um, he wrote comedies. He wrote romances. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote paranormal. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and it's fantasies. And, yeah, mm -hmm. and you know. I don't think he uh, wrote science fiction, but he definitely wrote fantasy. Well, what would one be considered science fiction? One could claim the Tempest fiction. is a little strange. So. Well, that was fantasy. Yeah, but there's some craziness in there. Mm -hmm. um, more so than 
you know, some of the others. Science fiction, any time that he postulated about, uh, you know, a science, uh, alchemy, or, yeah, or um, you know, chemicals and, and weapons. The witch's just because, group. Yeah, just because <laughs> it's in the future for him, it doesn't look like the future for us any longer. I would be interested to see how much was actually, a, you know, him thinking creatively about what the future of their technology at the Nick time Dad. would be. Yeah, it would be interesting. It would be interesting to see. Well, he used alchemy in a lot of his, you know, mm-hmm. like he was, you know, he uh, he would make reference to alchemy in, in several of his works. Um, so you would you'd get your science in that yeah. way. Yeah, you got to reframe science fiction for the past. <laughs> but he was obviously a fan of the paranormal. I mean, one can easily look at Hamlet for something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, fantasy with. Uh, you know, either The Tempest or... Uh, Midsummer Night's Midsummer's Dream. Midsummer's Night's Dream. It's all about fairies. Exactly. Uh, you know, and I think we we now kind of love to pigeonhole authors, but I think one of the great geniuses that he got to do was to write in all of these different things. It's it's why his comedies are hilarious and his tragedies make you cry. It's why his sonnets are beautiful and, yeah, I don't know, something I find fascinating. Hmm. Hmm? Shakespeare? Do we need to go back to rule four? Let's go back to rule four. Writing. Get it on the right. paper. So. Get it in a, front of people. You can't improve a page that doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. There's a, saying, there's a saying you can't edit a blank page. Yeah. Very true. Yes. Mm-hmm. They say all first drafts are crap. Um, I have some authors out there apparently that can get away with writing first drafts and getting them published, but I'm not Stephen King. Stephen uh, King writes two drafts. That's true, yeah. He writes one draft, he gives it to his wife, his wife corrects it, he fixes it, and then he gives it to his publisher. Two drafts. And yeah, apparently drafts. she misses some of the subplots that he leaves out to. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get by with that now, so. Yeah. I think he's going to sell enough, they don't really care if it's perfect. Yeah. No. <laughs> they only care if it's finished. That's kind of an interesting thing. He wishes somebody would edit him. <laughs> Shall I say something about Shakespeare? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I think that would be appropriate for the discussion. <laughs> yes. It is that uh, people interpret Shakespeare in whatever way they want, mm. and not, I think, at all necessarily in the way that Shakespeare intended. Like Romeo and Juliet, for example. You'll notice there that uh, it's a play about a couple of wild kids. Mm-hmm. Romeo at the beginning is all gaga over Rosalind, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> he has these wild friends who go around starting fights. Mm-hmm. And Mercutio. what happens so with sad. our with our sweet little girl who doesn't know anything except that she's going to get have to marry Count Paris, who's Those apparently a rich, good-looking guy. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but she doesn't want to do that. So these two wild kids get together separately, you know, and uh, get married and get killed. Doesn't that strike you as a plot which is in favor of children obeying their parents? Yes. And yet... Or also that love is worth fighting for and dying for. And, and really well, that's what modern thinking. gets out of it. I don't think that that's perhaps what Shakespeare meant in the first place. <laughs> and that's my point, that you can warp it around to any degree that you want because it is so flexible. But mm-hmm. the families hate each other, and that's a really main point of the plot. The, the family's hatred is actually responsible, yeah, maybe not for the suicide, but for a lot of the problems no, of the book. Yeah, it's basically like your modern Sopranos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And talking about how if it, during the scene after the death, the priest who married them talking to the families are, are determined to kill each other in that tomb, blaming each other for the death of these two characters. Mm-hmm. And showing, no, these two are showing you that you can put aside the differences. You can unite, and you can end all this bloodshed. And, you know, I think that priests talk really undercuts what you're saying, Fedora, because that was definitely a big point of what he was writing. Oh, I think he was against feuds, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, no. The real thing is to wait, because if she just waited yeah. for a second for <laughs> Romeo to wake yes. up, they she were, wouldn't have stuck uh, herself. A story of patience. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So, yeah, you know, if, you know, if she'd Too waited. Much. If, if, if Romeo he'd waited. had waited. <laughs> yeah. Because she was, Romeo was actually yeah, dead yeah. when she killed herself. Yeah. Right. So if Romeo had waited and not been impulsive, then, you know, 
Oh, what what that, isn't that Romeo's M.O.? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, a rash kid. That's yeah. his tragic flaw, his <laughs> impulse control. Yes. <laughs> Something mm. a lot of teenagers like. And he's so dramatic about it, too. First it's love, then it's death. They jump into those sword fights. <laughs> yeah. A lot can be said about Shakespeare, and we've said quite a lot here. And we could go on for a couple more hours talking about Shakespeare. Hamlet alone. <laughs> Hamlet, uh, Hamlet alone, I think my, my personal favorite is Henry V, which I think explores the role of leadership um, and what a true leader should be using it as a king. But I'm gonna end this uh, end this session of Right Back Radio with an ep- the epilogue of the last play that Shakespeare wrote, The Tempest. Now my charms are all overthrown, and what strength I have's mine own. What, which is the most faint now it is true. I must be here confined by you. Or sent to Naples. Let me not, since I have my dukedom got and per- pardon the deceiver, dwell in the bare island by your spell. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hand yeah, with the help of your good hands. Gent sorry, I'm reading and I don't have my reading glasses touch. <laughs> Gentle beneath of yours my sails must fill or else my project fails, which was to please. Now I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, and my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all fault. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. And that is said to be his farewell to the acting stage. And with that, tune in next week for yet another interesting talk about the writing industry.